from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's Editorial Director. And today we're going to be talking about Libya and what recent developments there may mean for the future of the conflict. Just over a year ago, in April 2019, Khalifa Haftar and his Libyan National Army launched a campaign against Tripoli in the internationally recognized Government of National Accord. Amid the escalating conflict, the country has become a major proxy struggle, with Russia, the UAE, Egypt, and France backing Haftar, and Turkey supporting the GNA. In recent weeks, however, Haftar's campaign has been rolled back as forces aligned with the GNA have made significant gains with Turkish assistance. To help us make sense of the situation, we're joined today by two great guests, Jonathan Weiner and Gunul Toll. Jonathan's a scholar at MEI and has served in a number of roles of the U.S. government, including as Special Envoy for Libya and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Law Enforcement. Gunul is the director of MEI's Turkey program and a senior fellow with the Frontier Europe Initiative. Jonathan, Gunul, thank you both for joining us today and welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Jonathan, the capture of Watia Air Base by forces affiliated with the GNA on May 18th seems like a major turning point in the conflict in Libya. Is this the end of the road for Haftar? Well, Haftar has been uh, losing uh, throughout 2020. He made no progress for a very, very long time after his initial decision to attack Tripoli in April 2019. There have been aerial bombardment that's continued day by day by day. They've attacked hospitals. They've killed uh, healthcare workers. They forced patients to flee and hundreds of thousands of refugees without securing any territory. The reason why this particular loss matters so much is that this was their air base in the West. And they previously lost some important strategic spots in the South. But this was the one that they had in the West that they needed to hold on to. So it's a big deal. It's hard to see uh, how they come back from it. But of course, Turkey played a very key role in uh, making it happen to offset the Russian forces, in particular the Russian snipers and the uh, uh, Emirati uh, drones that have been carrying out the air-, air assaults on Tripoli previously. Jonathan, how are Haftar's foreign patrons, Russia, the UAE, Egypt, and France, responding to the changing situation on the ground? Well, they're all a little different. I mean, France for a while has been, I think, pretty sincerely wanting to have uh, the uh, ceasefire with Haftar holding on to his gains and thus having some kind of a strategic advantage in connection with negotiations for a follow-on to the existing political agreements. And I don't think France's position has changed much uh, on that. Egypt and the Emirates have long had two different views of Haftar. First, they see him as a LCC-type strongman who could extend the same kind of stability and control over Libya that al-Sisi did in Egypt after the Emiratis helped put him in place and helped get rid of the Muslim Brotherhood. But they also have found Haftar to be exasperatingly difficult, not just independent, but contrary, making his own decisions ultimately, uh, not following their counsel, just difficult. And they both told me, me this back in 2016, and they've expressed complaints about it from time to time since. What they're saying to people in the region lately is, uh, we're done with him. This was an experiment that failed. Uh, We're done with this particular version of the experiment. We've seen them looking for a while for possible alternatives. Saif Qaddafi is one possibility, for example. Russia, by contrast, I think, uh, has always really tried to maintain strategic ambiguity about what they're doing. It's not us. It's just these Wagner mercenaries. The military forces they just put in the the fighter aircraft in the last week to 10 days, it looks to me, are are there to, at the very least, protect their forces against Turkish attacks as they leave the Tripoli area, uh, and then potentially to create other options for themselves, whether it be uh, maintaining an air base, maintaining a relationship with the eastern government, preventing a further route of Haftar, uh, issuing punishing attacks in Tripoli. It's not clear. I think the strategic ambiguity is intentional and real. You know, Turkey is the main backer of the Tripoli-based government and has provided significant air and ground support, drones, military advisors, Syrian mercenaries. And that's been instrumental in turning the tide against Haftar's forces. Is this a win for Turkey in your view? Well, to answer that question, Alistair, I think one has to understand two things. And the first one is, uh, what is it that that Turkey is trying to achieve by militarily engaging in uh, the Libyan conflict? 
And the second question one has to answer to make a judgment on whether this is a win uh, for Turkey or not is what will Haftar's backers do next? So on the first question about Turkey's goals of uh, its military engagement in Libya, uh, Turkey has several goals. One of them is securing uh, economic and and energy interests. But I think more importantly, um, Turkey wants to redraw the maritime boundaries in Eastern Mediterranean, which was established by Greece's bilateral agreements with Egypt and the Republic of Cyprus. Turkey focuses on, on Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, through its involvement in in Libya. As you know, um, since the discovery of sizable gas reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean in 2009, the coastal states have been mired in a dispute over maritime borders. But the problem is that they cannot agree on their respective exclusive uh, economic zones. These are the the maritime areas uh, where within which states claim uh, exclusive rights to exploit uh, natural resources like gas. So Greece signed several bilateral agreements which um, defined uh, maximal boundaries for Greece and and Cyprus, and that left a very narrow strip of water to Turkey. And to change that, Turkey signed an agreement in late November 2019 with Libya's UN-backed government demarcating the two sides Mediterranean territory. So to make sure that Erdogan's only ally in the Eastern Mediterranean, who is um, Saraj, uh, obviously aside from Turkish Cypriots, Erdogan wants to make sure that he survives Haftar's offensive. And that's why Turkey stepped up its military involvement. Now, the agreement that Turkey signed with Libya establishes EEZs for each country, but these Uh, zones overlap with the area Greece considers part of its uh, continental shelf. So the only way to solve this problem for Turkey is through diplomacy with other coastal states, such as Egypt, Israel, um, Lebanon, uh, and and Syria. So Erdogan might hope that, that the agreement he signed with GNA will fix his problems in Eastern Mediterranean, but it won't. So if you look at it from that perspective, this is what has happened in Syria. The military gains is not really going to help much achieve that goal. And the second question is, is about um, what will others do? What will those countries who have been backing Haftar, Haftar do uh, next? Uh, as Jonathan just mentioned, they all might be frustrated with him. But I'm sure they will start looking for a replacement. Uh, all those countries, uh, like Egypt, uh, the UAE, uh, Russia, they all have interests in Libya. The UAE and Egypt want to contain Turkish influence across the Middle East and particularly um, North Africa. Uh, Russia has its own interests. So I, I doubt they will sim- simply leave the scene to Turkey and no one is going to back, back out unilaterally. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I want to make one point, though, that I think is is ironic, and, and it follows through all what's just been said by Donald about Turkey, which is that every country that's engaged in Libya has made a big strategic mistake in part. Turkey's uh, decision to uh, try and push the oil and gas absolutely infuriated Greece and created a huge kickback, and I don't see how they now get out of uh, the strategic quandary where uh, they created, where if they don't go ahead and exploit it or try to, it looks like a defeat, and yet they can't do it without tremendous uh, counter pressure from EU countries. Similarly, the Emirates, the last thing the Emirates wanted or Egypt was to see Turkey have greater influence in Libya, and that's exactly what they've accomplished. So it's not really working for anybody. Um, we'll see whether it works for the Russians. Gunul, a number of countries, including the U.S., Germany, France, and the U.K., have been pushing for a ceasefire in recent days. I'm curious to get your view on what it would get to to get Turkey to agree to that, given that now its side in the conflict is is gaining ground. Well, I think agreeing on a ceasefire is not the problem here. I think neither Turkey nor Russia wants a direct confrontation. Um, GNA forces on Monday uh, suspended air attacks and gave uh, their rivals 72 hours to withdraw from from the Tripoli region. And uh, the hundreds of uh, Wagner fighters were also evacuated to the southeast of the the capital. And the Russian military aircraft then transported them to central Al-Jufra Air Base. So all these things suggest that there is a 
a Russian-Turkish understanding. And Russian fighters deployed at Jufra are probably there to make sure that GNA forces do not advance further. So looks like Turkey and Russia are, are carving up their own spheres of, of influence. But the bigger question is, I think, can these countries that are backing op- opposing sides agree on a deal that will secure their interests? In other words, are, are their interests reconcilable? And I'm leaving aside the more complicated actors, such as the UAE, for instance, and and also Turkey-Egypt relationship is is, is pretty problematic. Uh, Can Russia and Turkey, for instance, find a win-win solution? And not even talking about issues of high politics, but on simpler issues, such as securing their economic interests, given the economic troubles facing uh, Libya. Uh, as you know, Turkey has long wanted to expand the market for its consumer goods and, and secure opportunities for its construction companies in Libya. And given Turkey's access to other regional economies are, are, are limited due to all the problems that Turkey has been having with these countries, Libyan market becomes much more important for Turkey. And Turkey's defense industry, which uh, is providing most of the weapons shipped to GNA, is also eyeing a larger share there. Ankara also wants to recoup business losses that its companies have suffered after the conflict uh, in Libya started in 2011. And also, Turkey wants to have a say over, over Libyan energy resources. And Russia wants all these things too. So I think the question here is, in their respective visions of a post-war Libya, can these interests be be reconciled. I think that is the problem. And at this point, at least where Russia stands on these uh, is not clear to me uh, because of what Jonathan just said. uh, Russia is being very vague on on these things. Yeah, I think Russia is intentionally uh, maintaining its options and to see what uh, what the opportunities might um, pop up. So I think it's intentionally being strategically ambiguous which is why we can't figure it out, because they're keeping uh, lots of chances open. Jonathan, in addition to the the question of, of Turkey and Russia and the issue of the ceasefire, there's also the question of what to do with Haftar now. You've dealt with him on a number of occasions in the past. How do you think he's likely to respond to this reversal in fortunes? He, he doesn't really seem like the sort of person who's just going to, to ride off into the sunset. He previously rode off into the sunset, which is to say he was captured in Chad. Um, and abandoned by Gaddafi, went to the United States, wound up with uh, having a relationship with the U.S. government to overthrow Gaddafi or at least cause him trouble. The U.S. government then decided that wasn't really what it wanted to do. He was uh, forgotten for uh, decades, came back, didn't get the uh, prestige and uh, status that he felt was his dessert, and since then has been trying to be a dictator. So does he have any alternative to being a dictator in mind? He has none. He intends to be a dictator. End of story. And he will continue to fight, I believe, until his last dying breath. Um, the question is, who's going to follow him? And that really is the question. Uh, is Russia going to continue to use him after investing this much in him, as long as it's useful to them? But of course, they're going to hedge their bets, as they already are doing with the Speaker of the House in the East, Aguil Asala. I think it's quite clear that uh, people will be looking for alternatives to Haftar. It's, just, it's not clear to me whether they're going to find them. He's there until somebody kicks him out, and uh, the somebody's going to have to be somebody with enough power to kick him out. Um, if the Russians cut off his money, his access to money, his access to weapons, if the Emiratis and Egyptians do the same, uh, at some point, somebody inside Libya is going to decide he's a liability and uh, move to supplant him. But it's going to require that kind of signaling. But where do old dictators go? Uh, where do they go to retire? Sometimes they go to the Gulf to retire. Uh, maybe there'll be a place in the Gulf that uh, will say, we think that you need to be here for a little while, Khalifa. It's not going to be a long time, just a little while we put other things into motion, and then nothing ever comes into motion. He's a wary guy. I can't imagine he'd believe anything like that. So uh, I think he's going to be around for a bit. But um, you know, the, the Yemen on screes of Yemen was around for a bit until one day he wasn't because somebody killed him. And um, sometimes the only way dictators leave the scenes, uh, scene is with that kind of a loss. Jonathan, I'm, I'm curious, given everything that's happened recently, do you think where we stand now, are we any closer to a political settlement or a resolution of the conflict in Libya? Um, there are two things that are uh, minimum required. The first is Haftar has made it clear that he will not negotiate 
a political settlement, and the West has made it clear that is the government national court. They don't believe he will negotiate a, a, uh, anything, and that uh, other than uh, a military standstill, that kind of thing, uh, military matters where he clearly uh, has a role right now, uh, negotiations with him are fruitless and they're not going to enter into them. So there's no political deal while he has continued to be a political actor. Uh, that ceases when internationals decide that he is no longer a political actor and refuse to treat with him. When France decides it will no longer deal with Haftar, when the UAE decides it will no longer deal with Haftar, when Egypt decides it will no longer deal with Haftar, when Russia decides it will no longer deal with Haftar, Haftar will have no place to go. And uh, there will be somebody else representing the interests that he represented, which to some extent were former Qaddafiites, people who'd done well under the old regime, to some extent were tribes that um, uh, felt they'd lost since the previous regime, and to some extent were people in the East, uh, Barca, um, Cyrenaica, uh, who felt they had done poorly during the Qaddafi years and want more. Somebody has to represent those people. So the successor to Haftar is ultimately going to have to be identified. Hasn't been identified yet. Gunul, how do you think Ankara will proceed going forward? If, as you said earlier, Turkey's real goal here is to to redraw the maritime map in the eastern Mediterranean with uh, an eye to potential oil or natural gas resources, that really seems kind of as far off as ever. What's next for Ankara? Definitely. Well, on Libya, Turkey, I think, feels pretty confident now. The mood in Ankara must be that Turkey has made a, a low-cost, high-yield investment. It used Syrian mercenaries. It helped its defense industry by selling military equipment and, and turned the tide. So it's, it's not going to uh, back down. But of course, that mood might change in the future as Turkish public is increasingly critical of, of Turkey's military involvement, particularly in Libya, because whatever is happening in Libya doesn't quite resonate uh, well within Turkish public. But what's happening in Eastern Mediterranean does, and that's um, that's what President Erdogan is, is counting on. But the picture there is very complicated. As I said, changing the status quo in Eastern Mediterranean uh, goes through diplomacy with Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. You can't just send troops uh, or militarily involve yourself in the Libyan conflict and, and expect your problems to be solved in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's not that. That's really not going to work. And for Turkey to solve its its problems in Eastern Mediterranean through diplomacy is even a bigger challenge, given uh, the state of Turkey's relations with all these countries. With Egypt, I don't see normalization happening anytime soon. Uh, if Erdogan normalizes ties with Sisi, that will go against everything that he's done since the failed coup in 2016. He built his entire, he consolidated his power based on the anti-coup narrative. So that's why normalization with Egypt is, is not easy. There's been a debate uh, in, in Turkey on uh, Turkey-Israeli normalization. There have been uh, promising signs in the last uh, few weeks. But that is a big problem too, because uh, Erdogan thinks as long as Netanyahu is around, he's not going to deal with Israel. And the sentiment is is shared in, in Israel. Uh, with Lebanon, Turkey has, has problems with Lebanon, uh, with Syria, obviously, th th there are huge problems. So that's why I think Turkey's problems in Eastern Mediterranean remain uh, no matter what's happening in Libya. Jonathan, we're running uh, short on time, but before we wrap up, where do you see things going from here with the Libyan conflict? The first big question is, what does Russia do next? I think that the, what you see is um, some effort to maintain a separate power in the East. There's the problem that the East is essentially bankrupt because all the, the access to hard currency is kind of wiped out. So there, I think there'll be a resumption of political talks in a significant way um, without them going anywhere initially, but they will resume. You'll see a revivification of the UN process. Uh, the Emirates in, in, and uh, Egypt will look for an alternative to Haftar. Haftar will see what he can do to avoid drowning. And so I see, unfortunately, protracted uncertainty over the next six months rather than consolidation. Perhaps a pause in the war, that would be uh, great for Libya, uh, but no definitive political changes. The one thing that Libyans know how to do really well is stall, avoid reaching agreements, uh, see whether time can be to their advantage. And that's what I expect a lot of over the next months, with people also waiting to see the outcome of the U.S. elections, 
which could presage much greater involvement by the United States uh, in pressing for serious political accommodations that lead to the formation of an inclusive long-term uh, solution. We'll have to leave things there for now, but Jonathan Ganul, thank you both for joining the podcast today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We'll see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support. Thank you.